Hi, everyone. So as you can see there, I think, I hope for my first slide, if you can see it in a little bit, I was supposed to be up here with Megan Ramos. And I know a lot of you were probably looking forward to that. So today, not only am I going to do my part and talk about TRE, but I'm also going to do her part and talk about intermittent fasting, therapeutic fasting, and a brief review of the literature. So I wanted to thank, uh, first of all, Jeff. It's a pleasure to be here again. I did speak here before about uh, PCOS, which is my uh, passion. I did write a book on it. I'll talk a little bit about that in my disclosures. But today, I want to focus on this extremely important topic. And how lucky am I to follow uh, Dr. Ken Berry up here, because he sort of prepped me up a little bit. And I think he's absolutely right. If you are eating properly, if you're eating the right diet, then uh, intermittent fasting, particularly time-restricted eating, should come natural to you. But uh, that, is, that is not exactly what I am seeing. And so I wanted to talk to you a little bit about that. But before that, let me introduce myself briefly. I did write a book with Dr. Jason Fung. It's called The PCOS Plan. And Megan and I, along with our amazing colleague who's also here today somewhere, Dr. Terry Lance, we do host a podcast, which is a lot of fun. And uh, I graduated from CCNM in 2004, so I've been doing this for uh, 20 years. So I'm a naturopathic doctor. And uh, a little different from my other colleagues, the other naturopaths, I actually decided in 2004 to move back to my home country. So I'm from Mozambique, Southeast Africa, and grew up in Canada. And I decided to go back to Mozambique because my uh, objective at the time, as a very young 20, four-year-old, I wanted to work with uh, mummies and babies, except that when I got to Mozambique, that was not available to me. So I thought I was going to Mozambique, as probably most African kids, you know, when they have the opportunity to study abroad, I thought I was going to go to Mozambique and work with starving people. And when I got to Mozambique, the Minister of Health himself told me that I had to open a weight loss clinic in the capital of Mozambique. And that, to me, was a shocker. I didn't really have a choice, let me tell you. So I'm a big believer in karma. It got me to where I am today, 20 years later. So I have 20 years of experience working with metabolic syndrome. And in uh, 2016, I met Dr. Jason Fung at one of these conferences, and I started working with him in Megan Ramos at the time, the Intensive Dietary Management Clinic in Toronto. Fast forward a few years. And I am now still a health consultant and an executive coach for what is now known as the fastingmethod.com, which is basically the online program. So a brief history of our uh, program. It was founded in 2012 by Megan and Jason in Toronto. I did join them in Toronto at the clinics in 2016. Uh, IDM um, did see in, uh, inpatient, it was an inpatient clinic until 2019, at that time, it moved entirely online. And that's when the fasting method began, the online program. Right now, we have an amazing program because we have this huge community. I know a lot of you are here today, and I'm so happy that I got to meet some of you in person. We have this huge community. We do health coaching and master classes. But it's, it's sort of a funny thing, right? Because if you just listen to, to Ken's presentation, why do you need a fasting method, right? Because most of us, should fast naturally uh, if we're eating properly. And I, and I don't disagree with that necessarily. So here's a little outline of what I'm gonna be talking about today. What is TRE? What does TRE stand for? Time-restricted eating versus therapeutic fasting. Who should use therapeutic fasting? How to fast for insulin resistance? And a brief review of the literature. So the reason why I'm talking about TRE today is because Megan, Megan Ramos, she, it's, this is not a self-proclaimed uh, term, she uh, uh, decided to crown me as a TRE queen. And the reason for this is because I harp on this every single day with every single person that I meet in every single one of my group meetings and every single one of my coaching sessions with the people in my life, with the people that had to have dinner with me yesterday, and so on and so on. I am the queen of TRE because I do believe that TRE is the epitome of intermittent fasting. I, it's the Beyonce of the show. It is the main event. It is the foundation of your success with any dietary approach. 
and with any fasting schedule that you may or may not do, depending on your objective and your healing uh, purpose, okay? I'm also very, very grateful to the many speakers before me. It's so, I, thank you, Jeff, for putting me on Sunday. This actually did uh, make my life a lot easier because you got to hear so many of these amazing experts talk about low carb, and particularly uh, Brett, who talked on the very first day about therapeutic ketosis. And it's, that's funny, not funny, because we've been using the term therapeutic fasting for so many years, and I now feel like when I explain that to you, it's gonna make so much more sense. But let's start with TRE. So of course, I'm all into social media, probably with a little help from my 12-year-old that's here today, and uh, <laughs> she's way better at it than I am, but luckily for me, I get her for free. And so, um, you know, I'm, I'm just following a little online trend here. You know, what people think TRE is, right? So simple, but what TRE actually has the potential of uh, doing for you or of you doing for yourself. So let's talk a little bit about this. Most of you are probably very familiar with TRE. It's probably what you equate to intermittent fasting, right? So TRE for most of you is probably um, one of these schedules, a 20 slash 4, 16, 8, 18, 6. In fact, 18, uh, 18, 8, uh, 18, 6 and 16, 8 is probably what most of you already do. Probably because you follow this amazing diet that Ken and all the other people have been talking about. Um, that's why you're here. And so this is a concept, probably the former concept, of eating windows, right? A large fasting window of 16 to 18 hours, and then this six to eight hour eating window. And thanks to my colleague, Dr. Terry Lance, who's here today and who does the podcast with us, I would like to encourage you, we would like to encourage you to redefine your concept of TRE. And I am, like uh, one of the previous speakers, Dr. Lyon, I am going to uh, challenge you to test yourself, because you may not believe me when I tell you this, but please do remember that I come with a lot of experience. Okay, I'm not just standing here because, whatever reason, because Jeff wanted a substitute for Megan. I am coming to you with 20 years of metabolic syndrome experience. I am coming to you with 10 years of clinical experience, fasting patients, all kinds of patients, not probably the patients that some of you guys or some of the clients that some of you guys see. I don't see the performance athletes. I don't see, you know, a lot of those people. I see the really sick people. I see the people that are very metabolically unwell. I see the people that have tried the keto diet and say that the keto diet doesn't work. I just want you to consider that. Okay, and I do think the keto diet works, by the way. So let's redefine TRE. Instead of these large eating windows, let's rather look at TRE as meals. So it's actually the same thing. So when you talk about your eating day, regardless of how much fasting you do, regardless of whether you do therapeutic fasting or not, but when you talk about your eating day, tell me how many TREs you do. In other words, how many meals, okay? And so, let's look at this. So this is the former concept that probably many of you recognize. Eating windows, 16 to 18 hour overnight fast, or maybe you do a 12 hour overnight fast, and then you have this large eating window. And then what likely happens? It's not what's supposed to happen, and Ken said this. If you're eating a proper diet, proper human diet, this is not really what's supposed to happen. But I bet you that this is what's happening to some of you and to most of your clients or patients if they're telling you that they're not seeing success. So a former concept, but likely throughout the day, this is what's happening. And these are not insulin spikes. I'm not calling these insulin spikes. And most of the people that you're working with and I'm working with are not eating a whole lot of junk, quote unquote, not high carb. That's not what's raising their insulin at the end of the day. You know, they're having a little bit of coffee with cream. And by the way, I am known as a dairy Nazi. That's a whole other thing. I'll talk to you a little bit about that maybe if I have a chance. Commercially flavored waters, a few almonds a couple of hours later. Then comes your favorite low carb meal because you're doing great and probably even fasting a little bit longer, quote unquote. And then you have your favorite keto dessert maybe an hour or so later. And then a few more almonds. And then before bed, bone broth, because bone broth is really good for you. But here's the thing, 
all of these things may be good for you, bad for you. I am one of these people that I personally do not like to categorize foods. I don't think it helps. I don't like to categorize foods as good foods or bad foods, at least not in that sense, okay? What I'm putting forward to you today is that, and I joke all the time that as your coach, if I were your coach, but to my clients, I'm here to keep your eye on the ball, okay? It isn't about calories. It isn't necessarily about carbs. When it comes to insulin resistance, it's about insulin. So all of these good foods or bad foods, low calorie, high calorie, low carb or high carb, they raise your insulin to a, a degree, okay? That we have to agree on here because it's important for us to agree on this before we move on. So even some of these, ver these no calorie foods, like uh, one of the doctors yesterday mentioned Coke Zero. My daughter will be the first one to, to tell you that if I go to a restaurant, my husband orders wine, I order Coke Zero because I don't really like alcohol and I would rather have the Coke Zero. It's not something I'm saying is good or bad because again, I'm not categorizing it, but it raises your insulin, yet it has no calories. All right, you may not agree with me, but again, I'm gonna challenge you to test this in yourself. So, at the end of the day, you're following TRE, but you're not doing great. I'm not saying that these foods here cause hyperinsulinemia. What I'm proposing to you is that they're not gonna help you in your fight towards reversing hyperinsulinemia, insulin resistance, if that's what you have. And I'm gonna borrow a term here. I first heard Megan use this, insulin stacking. I know that if you know, if you're a medical doctor, you know that this term is used for type one diabetics when they're using their insulin improperly, but I would like to use this because I think it's pretty strong. I would like to use this to remind you that when you're doing this throughout the day and you're saying, but it's just almonds, it's just cream in my coffee, and it's my low carb meal, which is great, and it's, you know, all the other things that I just talked about in the previous slides, right? Remember that throughout the day, what you're likely doing if you're insulin resistant and if you're very insulin resistant, because everybody's on the spectrum of insulin resistance, right? And thank you, Nina, for pointing out to us that 88% of us North American adults have metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance. So you're somewhere on the spectrum. And the higher you are up that spectrum, and you probably know if you're higher up, you're gonna have a much higher insulin response to each and every single one of these foods. So then what do we do, right? That's where my concept comes in. Let's redefine TRE. And according to Ken, and I think he's absolutely right, if you are following the proper human diet, what I'm about to show you should come so easy, and we should all agree on this, okay? So, the quote-unquote new definition of TRE, which is not new at all, but it might be new to some of you, is that in order for you to have the success, so again, the Beyonce of the show, the epitome of intermittent fasting, in order for you to have success with your therapeutic ketogenic approach and with whatever fasting protocol you choose to do, your newer concept should be based on meals and not eating windows, okay? So, very simple. You fast for 16 or 18 hours, or maybe you're doing not two meals a day, two MAD stands for two meals a day, but maybe you're doing three meals a day. Some of the speakers today talked about that. And then you're leaving a gap between those meals. And so, let's say you are doing, you are in the intermittent fasting world. Most of us are doing two MAD. Some people are doing something a little different, but, one meal, well, your favorite low-carb meal, followed by a five to seven hour mini fast, as Megan would call it, and then followed by your second low-carb meal. So what is your objective here? First of all, this is hard to do, by the way, I recognize, but it's important, and it's worth the effort. And again, if you're eating the proper human diet, you should walk away from each of those meals satiated. So if you're not walking away from each of those meals satiated and you need to go eat your almonds or your favorite keto dessert or whatever it is an hour or two later, you need to reassess that first meal, okay? And actually, I'm the one telling you that it's okay for you to bring all of those things into that first meal, even the Coke Zero. You could make better choices. I could make better choices and I do most of the time, but even that, you can bring that into your first meal. Why? Because let me go back there for a second. Every time that you eat, again, whether it's a good meal, bad meal, high calorie, low calorie, high carb, low carb, you're raising insulin. 
you can define how much insulin you raise in each meal by choosing how you eat. And that's actually, these are uh, some of my five pillars, so I'll just go over them. Obviously, the first one is TRE, the Beyonce of the show, how you eat. The second one is when you eat. I'm a big fan of the circadian rhythm of eating and fasting. I do believe that we should, whenever possible, eat those two meals before sunset. You should choose your foods properly, and there's a lot of people in here that can help you with that. And then four and five is stress and sleep management. Huge. I know uh, some have talked about it. You, you know, there's a lot more to that. So anyway, if you eat that meal, if you eat all the right things during that meal, you should be able to walk away from that meal. I do have a strategy that I've created many years ago for myself that I use with my clients called plating, which very simply is a mindful eating practical technique where you put a nice plate on a table and that's where you eat. You don't eat while you are working, while you are cooking, while you are cleaning up, while you're driving, on your couch, at your desk, from a fridge, from a package. That is not how you eat. You eat in front of that beautiful plate. So throughout the day, as you're practicing to create this newer concept, or if you want to challenge me and prove me wrong, then you would use this strategy where you would catch yourself throughout the day as you're just getting things everywhere because you might be mindlessly eating all these healthy foods and not realizing that you're doing that throughout the day. So a really very useful to me technique was to, because that's what I did my whole life. I grazed and snacked all day. I never had one proper human, uh, proper human meal my entire life until I was in my 30s. And so then for a while at least, you practice this technique and you just put all of these foods, all the ones I mentioned before, but you put them around that plate and then you sit and you eat beginning to end. You eat your meal. It's not an eating window. You don't have 30 minutes, one hour, one hour and a half to eat. You sit down and you enjoy that meal. When you feel that you are done, you walk away. Now there's a lot of strategies here and I, as I said, there's a lot of experts here that can help you pick the right foods, and many other strategies to figure out, are you having the right amount of protein, the right amount of fat, the right amount of carbs? I mean, you can work on all that. If you walk away from that meal, so what I do with my kids is when they get up, I ask them, are you done? Do that to your, for yourself. Ask yourself, am I done? Because when you get up, you're done. You're done eating. Now you can go about your business. And then five to seven hours later, again, plain water, black coffee, plain tea. Why? Because if you're putting cream in your coffee, if you're having flavored, commercially flavored waters or anything else, it's okay. But you have to bring that into your meal, okay? So, is there a difference between the former concept of eating windows versus meals? There's a huge difference. And again, I'm coming to you with experience. Lots and lots of clinical experience in many, many years. Okay, so now we move on to, let's pretend I walked off the stage and Megan came on, and I am going to probably not do her justice, but I will do my best. And these are her slides that I have uh, looked over and modified slightly, but let's talk about TRE versus therapeutic fasting. Therapeutic fasting is so much easier, as I said, for me to define for you, because Brett defined therapeutic ketosis, and I thought that was brilliant. So therapeutic fasting is defined as a controlled and voluntary abstinence from all calorie-containing food and drinks for a specific, specified period of time. This differs from starvation, which is neither deliberate nor controlled, and I added in, and for an unknown amount of time. The reason why I chose to put this uh, definition here that's uh, found in Megan and Jason's case report is because in a little bit, I'm going to do a very quick review of the literature out there on fasting, which uh, is next to none and it sucks, but uh, we'll go over it. Uh, the reason why I use that is because in the past, every single lecture that I've had to sit through and watch experts criticize fasting, the studies and research that they have shown to compare, to, to talk about fasting have been studies on people that have been going through starvation, not fasting. Okay? And that really gets, uh, <laughs> it bothers me slightly. Uh, and the other thing is because uh, just a, a lot of these, uh, even the ones that I'm going to mention today, uh, you know, when we talk about therapeutic fasting, again, we're talking very specifically about treating something. 
right? We're treating somebody with obesity. We're treating somebody with PCOS. We're treating somebody with diabetes. It's a therapy. So let's, let's talk a little bit more about that. The purpose of therapeutic fasting then, of course, very obvious, is to suppress your insulin levels for an extended period of time. It's to dramatically reduce that insulin load on the body that's causing that insulin resistance. It's to break the cycle of insulin resistance. So the very first study that Megan uh, wanted to show you is progressive alterations in lipid and glucose metabolism during short-term fasting in young adult men. And you can see from this graph that the plasma insulin decreased drastically, 70% uh, decline within the first 24 hours, and then a further 50% decline between the 12 and 72 hours. Fat loss begins during this period of time. And you know this happens because, of course, insulin goes down, the body goes into fat burning mode. The problem here is that most of the people uh, walking around out there that even are doing fasting are probably not fasting long enough for this to happen, right? So not therapeutic. They're not seeing healing, they're not seeing results. So insulin, uh, uh, therapeutic fasting that of course is there to break that cycle of insulin resistance. And we know that hyperinsulinemia leads to insulin resistance, so too much insulin in the blood, high insulin leads to insulin resistance, and then of course insulin resistance itself causes the body to produce this excess insulin. Sustaining low levels of insulin for an extended period of periods of time helps to break that cycle. And let's be honest, the people that we see, like I said, are the extremely insulin resistant people. They're the people coming to us saying, the keto diet doesn't work for me, or this and that doesn't work for me, or I've tried everything and I'm desperate. And we can help them. So who should fast therapeutically? Basically what I just finished telling you. They're the people with very, very high insulin resistance. And I love this quote from Dr. Jason Fung, if the problem is too much insulin, the solution is to reduce insulin. Simple enough. So. Therapeutic fasting schedules, the, you know, the, the intermittent fasting schedules most uh, commonly uh, known are the ADF, alternate day fasting, for 24, 30, 36, 42, 48 hours, two or three times a week. The extended fasting, that's only really available to a few of us, let's be honest. You know, not everybody has that fasting muscle or has a fasting coach or has, you know, the ability to do extended fasting, but a lot of people do and do it very well therapeutically with a lot of uh, excellent healing benefits. The fasting uh, liquids uh, permitted or fluids permitted, also known as fasting aids, are of course water, tea and coffee, bone broth or low carb vegetable broth, and sugar free pickle juice. People often ask us this what can I have during a fast? Does cream in my coffee break a fast? So that I would have to take you right back to my TRE. It's not about whether it's breaking a fast or not, okay? It's about TRE, it's about bringing all of that stuff everything that raises insulin into your meals and not raising your insulin at all if you can help it between meals if you're trying to heal insulin resistance. If the problem is high insulin, the solution is to lower insulin. Uh, <clears throat> Megan chose another article, uh, a randomized pilot study comparing zero calorie alternate day fasting to daily caloric restriction in adults with obesity. And so the takeaway from this was that the alternate day fasting group lost more total, so the body composition changed mostly in the ADF group where they burn more fat, particularly trunk fat, than the low calorie group. They maintained more of the lean muscle, which is important, we just heard one of the last speakers talk about this, and they maintained their uh, resting metabolic rate, okay? I also <laughs> wanna tell you that even in this study that wasn't uh, necessarily negative towards fasting, what is, zero calorie alternate day fasting mean, right? I would rather it said zero insulin producing alternate day fasting, okay? I just want you to remember that. I'm always gonna remind you of this, even at the very end. So this is an amazing case report by Megan and Jason and two of their colleagues. And this was done back in, uh, published in 2017. Three guys from our clinic, therapeutic use of intermittent fasting for people with type two diabetes as an alternative to insulin. So what do we see here? Three guys between the ages of 40 and 67. They had been on insulin, 70 units of insulin daily at least 
for at least 10 years, one of the guys for, or, or, sorry, they, they had been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes for at least 10 years, one of the guys for 25 years. Each of them were on at least 70 units of daily insulin, and they, all three of them did alternate day fasting for a period between 7 to 11 months. And what were the outcomes? I, in my original slide, I had this red around the last column there, the five outcomes measured. All three of these guys got off of insulin. The one guy got off of insulin in five days. The other two guys got off of insulin in less than three weeks, okay? Amazing, obviously, because isn't uh, type 2 diabetes supposed to be this chronic progressive disease that gets worse and worse, but yet we can reverse it. We can reverse it with therapeutic ketosis. We can reverse it with therapeutic fasting. So let's use these two things together. I, I, I love the quote from... Maya Angelou that says, we're a lot more like my friends than we are different. Let's remember that. We may not agree on everything, but we can definitely work together because all we want to do is help our patients, right? So the other outcomes were unbelievable. Two of these guys got off all of their diabetic medication. One stayed on one medication. They lost weight. They lost belly fat. I mean, amazing. Let me tell you my experience with working with uh, men particularly because I do work with a lot of women, mostly women. And uh, a lot of women come to me either because they're overweight, postmenopausal women. I do see a lot of younger women because of PCOS and fertility. But I see a lot of guys, have seen a lot of guys. Now, Coach John sees most of them. Uh, they feel uh, pretty good talking to a guy that looks like that after, you know, he's got amazing. Uh, his, his own personal progress has been one of the best I've seen to date. And, uh, but what are these, uh, most of these guys, why do they come to me? Because they had type 2 diabetes, yes. But what was the other thing? Can you guess? That's right, erectile dysfunction. And uh, every single guy that I've worked with, once you reverse this, their sexual function comes back. My daughter's telling me I have two minutes. Is that possible? <laughs> oh, 20 minutes. Thank you. OK, so the headlines. After me telling you all of this, right? The headlines are still that fasting, scientists find no benefit to time-restricted eating, and Jason just was not having this. So in his newsletter, he decided to analyze this particular study in very Jason style, and so he went on to show you that this study sucked, that it was underpowered, <laughs> and uh, time-restricted eating group versus a uh, regular group, the control group. So the time-restricted eating group had an eating window, you already know that's a problem, of eight hours, and the, uh, the other group had an eating window of 10.2 hours. So the difference between the control group and the uh, TRE group was a 16% increase of fasting. But in order to show significant uh, results, right, in order to show uh, that this study proved that fasting was better, they had to show an increase in 29% weight loss. So for you to be able to actually compare this, you would have to at least increase their fasting by 29%, I would guess. I'm not a researcher. I thought this was ridiculous. Jason thought it was ridiculous too. He also said, this study sucks. It's underpowered. It, then he goes on to talk about things that I'm not even... I'm like, Megan, do I really need to talk about ultimate versus proximate causes? But basically what he says is that uh, these, this would be okay if A and B were independent variables, but clearly they're not independent variables, meaning calorie restriction versus TRE, and these are actually dependent variables, therefore this study does not work. And this is but one of these studies. I mean, there aren't many studies. If you guys think that there aren't enough studies about low-carb and ketogenic diet, you, you, like me, think that there should be a million studies out there that the government should be telling everybody to eat a ketogenic diet, that, you know, all scientists should think this is the best thing ever. You can get people off of medicine? Well, this is crazy. But that's not what's happening. That's not the literature that's out there. If you, if you are aware of that when it comes to low-carb diet, Obviously, it's much, much worse when it comes to fasting. Who wants to fund fasting? Nobody, right? Who, who benefits if people start fasting and eating less often? <laughs> Absolutely nobody. So anyway, all these studies suck. Jason's conclusion, this study does not show that there are no benefits to fasting or TRE, as the headline would have you believe. Instead, the study is merely underpowered and designed to investigate independent variables instead of dependent ones. However, it also raises the hypothesis 
that fasting may indeed be more effective at weight loss, improve the durability of weight loss, and improve visceral fat mass. And that's because if you look at this chart here, there actually was a difference. It just wasn't deemed significant because the percentages didn't add up. But of course the TRE people, even though, remember their eating window was eight hours versus the other guys whose eating window was 10.2 hours, but there was still a difference. Now imagine, after having listened to me talking about TRE at the beginning, imagine they actually did a proper TRE study. Imagine instead of an eight hour window, people were doing two meals with a five to seven hour gap in between. What would the difference be there? And now imagine we compare this low calorie to therapeutic fasting. What do you imagine the results would be? Amazing, because that's what I see every single day. So, I, uh, Jeff was really worried that I was gonna talk either not, not enough, maybe, or too much. <laughs> but uh, I'm pretty much done here. What I wanna say to you is what I've already said. The literature sucks unfortunately, but you can uh, do your own experiment. And in the words of another coach from our program, Larry Diamond, who I love dearly, do your own N equals one experiment. I challenge you to, I'm going full circle here, right back to the beginning, I challenge you to, even if you're not quite ready, or maybe you don't need to do therapeutic fasting, but I challenge you to start with proper TRE and give TRE, time-restricted eating, the critical importance that it truly deserves because it does make a huge difference. And I think that's it. Thank you.